shop where he could get what he wanted. And when the transaction was finished, he was given a little clay tablet, two or three inches square. Into this tablet, he impressed his signet ring. This signet ring was his bond. Now, the dealer who secured the uh, signet uh, stone had several possibilities. He could, of course, exchange it with some other dealer for something else he wanted. And the token became a medium of ex general exchange. If, however, he did not wish to barter it, he could take it to the house of the owner or the person who had given it to him. And at the door of the house was the steward, usually seated. The steward accepted the token and gave the merchant its equivalent in coinage or whatever he needed. There was never any question as to the integrity of the transaction. Somewhere in our collection upstairs, we have one of these token bills pressed upon clay. It was a sign of honest and proper uh, transaction. And uh, the person who received it had no doubt about it being redeemed, nor did anyone through whose hands it passed. It was known beyond doubt that the original man who put his seal upon it was honorable, honest, and capable of meeting the indebtedness. Thus we have a beginning of a medium of exchange. Gradually it became obvious that bringing sheep to market to change for something else was a rather complicated procedure. So it became necessary to develop some form of symbolic medium of exchange. Every nation of antiquity developed such uh, types of material. There are coins that have come down to us that are cast in glass from very ancient dates. There are others that were cut into stone. Some were made into porcelain. And other various proper symbols, American Indian wampum, beadwork, the quarry shell of, a, of the South Pacific, all of these were mediums of exchange. In early Virginia colony, a bundle of tobacco leaves was currency. All these different forms were intended to facilitate transactions. And when it came so complicated that no one could really bring all his produce to market himself, then it became very important that he have tokens by which he could claim payment or by which he could give payment. These tokens multiplied and became more and more complicated. But in every instance, the token served only one purpose. It stood for value. It represented a legitimate monetary or financial or commercial value. It was given as a symbol of an object. Now, for instance, you can say we have what do we call today chattel mortgages. The word chattel, if you look it up, means cattle. And a chattel mortgage was an indebtedness placed upon a herd of animals. Of course, today it would be rather difficult and embarrassing to uh, drive a, a herd of cows into a bank. But still, in ancient times, always one thing was true. The token, whatever it was, was for value. And that value was fixed by the commodity patterns of the time. There was no escaping the simple fact that the token of itself had no value. The little lump of clay wasn't worth anything. The dollar bill cost to make it only a fraction of a cent. It has no value in itself. It is a symbol of value. Now, as long as it remained a symbol of value, we had a comparatively honorable state of exchanges. As long as this symbol was not re expected to be a thing of value, but was only a symbol of a personal relationship, either through purchase or sale. As long as this continued, 
things were relatively honest. Gradually, however, a change took place. In this change, the commodity, the token, began to be regarded as valuable in itself. It was possible to accumulate these tokens, and by accumulation of them, to declare to others that we possessed a kind of wealth. When a knight in the Middle Ages got short of change, he took his armor or his helmet to the armorer, the man who made it, who would loan him a little money on it temporarily. This again was only a form of barter. The collateral was held against the payment of the debt, but the collateral had no value other than as a symbol of an ethical transaction. When the early Dutch in uh, the end of Manhattan, south end of Manhattan Island, got together under a tree to form a benevolent association of mutual protection, it was the beginning of the stock exchange. That's how it all started. It was always a use of some convenient symbol by means of which transactions could be made more rapidly and more certainly and honorably. Gradually, the theory of accumulation took over. And of course, this theory of accumulation went head on into the Egyptian philosophy of life. Namely, that whatever you accumulated could only be with you for the duration of your present existence. Some of the Druids of Britain are said to have borrowed money in one lifetime and guaranteed to pay it back in a later embodiment. <laughs> this system, however, never became generally popular. <laughs> but the theory was always the same, that we had to have some way of dealing with each other in the necessities of life. One man raised the corn, another man wove the goods. The cloth and the corn were values. The man who ro wo uh, rose, uh, worked the corn changed it for yardage. This went on until finally we forgot the fact that the medium of exchange was a completely physical instrument. It had very little to do with anything except what it was intended to be, a way of handling a transaction. This gradually resulted in the concept that the coinage was something of eternal value, something that could be hoarded, something that could be passed on from one generation to another, and that finally, a superiority in this life was symbolized by coinage. Now, in old days, of course, coinage was not a symbol as it is to us. We look back upon the tales and legends of great wealth in antiquity. But most of this great wealth was in the hands of persons who had forgotten their own mortality. They had forgotten that they could not take it with them. They also learned, as they learned in Greece, that to pass it on to your descendants was one of the most dangerous procedures in the world, because in most cases it became a detriment upon the descendant. It prevented the descendant from going out and earning his own way. It prevented him from becoming a useful citizen, cooperating with others for the benefit of his society. He became an aristocrat simply because he accumulated little marks placed on tablets of clay or printed on the face of money. All this changed our psychology of life, and gradually, out of what we term the profit system, there has evolved the physical economic complexity which we know today. We have forgotten that we are not here primarily to accumulate. If we were going to live forever, it would be different. But in this foreverness of the, higher, of the higher world of things, the coinage cannot be considered immortal. It is part of a very simple procedure. 
a procedure of f food, clothing, shelter. A, f a procedure of guaranteeing the necessities of life by earning them and by earning them to gain the tokens or symbols by which we could meet our responsibilities. In those days, there was no idea, whatever, of money making money. Money was to be used by the person who earned it to meet the requirements of his society and to carry himself rather than to become a dependent upon society. As we went along in this particular problem, another situation appeared almost immediately. And this is very intriguing. The moment a standardized form of currency came into existence, two things happened. Maybe both, or at least one of them. One was that this currency could be devaluated. The Roman emperors... Uh, when they got into financial trouble, instead of issuing silver coins, made their coins of copper and coated them with silver. It seems to me that happened around here not too long ago. <laughs> Gradually, the coin no longer had a factual value. Now, as its moral and ethical value declined, its factual value became more obviously important in commerce. It became necessary that the coin itself be of some substance equal in value to the debt. The second thing that could happen and did happen frequently was that both the coinage and the currency or paper money was, or, was counterfeited. Now counterfeiting began at a very early time. It became part of our way of life as soon as it became obvious that it was profitable. The earliest paper money that we have any record of was issued in China during the Ming Dynasty, around 12 to 1300 AD. This paper money was about the size uh, now of a, a typewriter sheet. It was marked with seals and various symbols of authority, and it contained its values stated in terms of strings of cash, pictures of strings of small money. On, the, on each of these notes appeared the statement that anyone guilty of counterfeiting one of these bills would be shortened by the length of one head. But needless to say, this was not discouraging. The counterfeiting continued and, uh, will, and passed from one nation to another. Today, most coinage has been counterfeited somewhere because of it being profitable. It was a falsification. It was a definite a act of dishonesty, uh, but uh, it was tolerated. The culprit was punished, but the process went on. So the paper money got to be in bad repute in China as early as the 14th century. And from there on to the establishment of the Republic by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, paper money was practically never circulated in China. No one trusted it because it was worth nothing in itself. You couldn't eat it. It even made a very small fire if you tried to burn it. It was of comparatively no value unless behind it was a staple system of financial integrities. In China also, coinage was variously adulterated. A shrewd Chinese would take a bag full of small silver coins and get one of his younger children to shake that bag by the hour. At the end of a certain length of time, the shaking caused little shavings of the silver to separate. He then washed the bag and cashed the profit. In North China also, large silver coins were cut through horizontally, hollowed out, and sealed again. And then this latest, well, within the last 50 years, uh, 
Chinese banks put purple stamps on dollars and other large...